So, Max, as a massive Survivor fan, if you were to analyze your own gameplay, what would you say was your biggest mistake? My biggest mistake was simultaneously underestimating and overestimating Sherwin. Yeah. Underestimating her and that I thought that by not looking for the idol, she was displaying a lack of game savvy, that she was <laughs> kind of an old school survivor player, someone who didn't believe in strategy, or didn't believe in big moves. Overestimating that in the first time of council, when we sent so home, Shereen, Carolyn, and I conspired to do a blindside. And part of that blindside involved telling Joaquin and so that they should vote for Carolyn. Well, after that vote, Carolyn was very, very disturbed. She didn't understand why her name had been written down twice. She didn't understand the concept of a pawn or a decoy. And she confronted Joaquin and said, why did you vote for me? And Joaquin said, because Max told me to. Um, From that point on, Carolyn had me pegged not only as someone she couldn't trust, but also as some sort of Jim Jones-like cult manipulator who had gotten the members of my tribe to drink the proverbial Kool-Aid. And from that point on, Carolyn had a vendetta against me, a vendetta that she was ultimately successful in executing. How surprised were you to see that she had that idol? Did you find out watching TV? Um, I found out, oh boy, uh, not by watching it on TV, through conversations with, uh, you know, the, the Dirty 30, as we call ourselves, are probably the tightest cast in the history of the show. We spent an inordinate mm-hmm. amount of time hanging out, and um, I think it might have come up in one of our many epic hang sessions where we get together and relive the glories, the triumphs, and the agonies of defeat from our time out on Survivor. It was shocking <laughs> to find out that she, of all people, had the idol because yeah. she was the most adamant about the idol will only bring divisiveness to this tribe. That if we look for that idol, we are stealing our own fates, and anyone who has it will be the next person to go. Now, there's two ways of interpreting that. That's one, Carol is an unsophisticated game player who doesn't understand why an idol is truly a significant power within the game. And there is then the other way of interpreting it that if Carolyn is a serious game player who was manipulating all of us. And I am regretful to the fact that I didn't pick up on that fact, that Carolyn really knew what she was doing and she was masterfully playing everyone except Tyler by concealing the fact she had that idol. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, you know, what What did you do right out there? Like, what are you really proud of about your gameplay to, to make it to, what, six? You were the sixth out or oh, fifth out, fifth person out? Uh, what did I do good out there? Well, um, I built a terrific relationship with someone who I found to be a peer in every sense of the game, uh, that being Shireen, someone who I not only could strategize with at a high level, but whom I was fairly confident that I would defeat in a jury vote. Um, Shireen did not fit in at white collar. Shireen did not fit in at no collar. That said, she's brilliant. She's talented. She's accomplished. And she has the sort of perseverance that you really need to make it far in this game. That having, having that one true ally, people talk about the significance of having that one person who you can trust implicitly, that's mm-hmm. huge. And I have that. And there were not many people out there who I saw who had that. Um, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is most of my quote-unquote brilliant moves were actually foolhardy insofar as that they were brilliant only to the extent that Carolyn, Shereen, and I were this rock-solid alliance. They were moves mm-hmm. made with the assumption that what we had done in the three days had sealed the deal and that the three of us would be together on day 39, having that beautiful breakfast and that champagne as we awaited final tribal council. Now, if you look at that, if you look at everything I did in that context, you start to see that, oh, some of those things that Max did, for example, trying to, uh, uh, working with Shireen to make Joaquin increasingly irritated, to get him to, to lash out, to get him to have those sexist outbursts, that seemed brilliant if you think that Carolyn is part of our alliance. 
But when I find out now that Carolyn was not part of our alliance, and that not only that, but that she had true disdain for Shireen, well, I see the foolishness in my ways, that by needling Joaquin, we were, in fact, pushing Carolyn further and further away. With hindsight, you can start to see that the moves that in your mind seemed brilliant were, in fact, foolish. But it is important to me to acknowledge that, uh, you know, a, a critical mistake ultimately, you know, very early in the game, ultimately led to my undoing. And that mistake was not really adequately attending to Carolyn. Mm-hmm. And now, Max, we have to talk about the nakedness. Why did you walk around so much in your birthday suit, and what was your family's reaction to that? Um, I'll, I'll start with the second half of the question. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I, my family was proud about the fact that I looked so goddamn hot. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, my, my parents are – my mother is the biggest Survivor fan of all time. She did not mind at all so long as uh, it didn't hurt my game. And I don't think it did hurt my game. I never got any indication from my fellow tribe members or from the edit that my nakedness had anything to do with my downfall. The truth of the matter is the nakedness was a response to a practical situation, that being you don't get your bathing suit until day six. You're going to be taking a poop in the ocean well before that. In the interest of not having a Tarzan-like moment where you return to the shore and people are left to speculate on whether it's poop or dirt, I decided to try to <laughs> take that first aqua dunk au natural. When I came out of the water, I was asked by production if I could go back into the water because the helicopter had been summoned to film my glorious skinny dipping excursion. When that happened, suddenly um, a sort of practical reaction to a gross set of hygiene circumstances became an opportunity to have a little fun. And if I'm guilty of anything out there, it's of having as much fun as I possibly could have. I know that we're not really out there to have fun on Survivor. Brian Heideck famously described it as a business trip. But screw that. I was out there to have fun. I was out there to play hard, to experience all of the things that Survivor has to offer, the highs and the lows, the good and the bad, And given the opportunity to goof off on a day where we had nothing to do, where I felt secure in my alliance, where my tribe had just kicked butt in a challenge, you know, why am I not going to take advantage of that experience? I I think I would not have been doing justice to the survivor god if I hadn't had stripped down and frolicked in the water. It was also a tribute, I guess, to to Richard Hatch, the very first – uh, winner and p- my personal, you know, favorite winner of all time. So I love that, you know, season 30, uh, 15 years, and you're kind of giving a tribute to the, the original uh, player there, which I loved. I admit, listen, Richard Hatch is not only a great survivor player, he has been great to me. He um, participated in my class at Northwestern University both times I taught it, Skyping in mm. to talk to my students and with kids who were probably five or six years old when Richard's season first aired, I never saw as excited a reaction as I saw when Richard Hatch came on the screen for a Skype with my kids. Richard Hatch was an icon, and if I did something that recognized his influence not only on Survivor, not only on reality TV, but on popular culture in general, I mean, in terms of what Richard Hatch has done for changing perceptions of gay identity, uh, in, in American culture, the guy is a hero of mine. And while I didn't go out there with the express intention of paying homage to Richard Hatch, when I got the opportunity, I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna leave that opportunity on the table. Right. And being such a big fan, you probably went in there with a lot of expectations about what what would happen. But was there anything really unexpected that you just couldn't believe happened? Like like the story you just told me, how production told you to go back in the water, that's something that would be like, oh, so they do kind of, you know, have a small influence on what happens. One thing that people like Richard, people like Jonathan Penner, people like John Cochran told me a lot about before I played was the importance of maintaining a balance between the game of Survivor and the game that you're playing in collaboration with the production, about Mm -hmm. giving them what they want, about 
you know, Cochran didn't need to tell that story about pooping in his pants as a little kid. But by doing so, he endeared himself to the producers who appreciated the fact that he gave them this authentic moment. What that translates into, it might only be a, a healthy conversation, a relationship that is, is an escape from the stresses of the game where you get to talk to someone who actually enjoys having a conversation with you for an hour a day. It might be something more. It might be building a rapport. It might be uh, an understanding whereby they, they help you to understand the scenarios that you're facing through leading questions or something like that. I went into this with the mindset that I was going to play hard. I was going to give Survivor everything I had. And that might mean doing things that increase the size of the target that was on my back. Every time you go out to a challenge, Jeff asks a series of questions of the tribes. How are things at camp? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? You have two options in those situations. Do you keep your cards close to your chest? Do you bluff? Do you not let on how excited you are, how intelligent you are, how articulate you are? Or do you be yourself and let that enthusiasm, let that snarkiness, let that uh, articulate quality come through? And I'm the sort of person who chose the latter option. If Jeff Probst is going to ask me a question, I'm not going to give him the pat yes, no answer or the I don't know, Jeff, that's a good one. I'm going to tell him the truth because I value that. I value that in my life, and I value that in the game. And if that puts a big target on my back, so be it. I mean, one thing that I heard later on is that both of the other tribes had decided that at the first opportunity they had, they would both be out based on my interactions with Jeff on the map. You know, that the way I interacted suggested that I was smart, that I was game savvy, and that I was an asshole, <laughs> all of which are probably true. And, you know, it was both flattering and illuminating to hear them say later on, yeah, after we heard you mixing it up with Jeff, we pretty much decided that we'd go for you first. Mm. Well, great insights, Max. Thank you so much for talking to us. And uh, Thanks. I'm, hey, I'm some, say, I'm some coverage. Oh, you do? Thank you. Yeah, I, I love taking the, the sort of gambling approach, that more intelligent game theory-oriented approach to mm -hmm. uh, a game that I think is, is really serious, so it, it's cool to follow your site. Awesome. Well, I was actually predicting you to win that Gold Derby, so I'm a little bummed, but... I know, I know. Unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of people were, so I apologize to you and anyone else who is losing money on this. Um, oh, no, don't, don't, no worries, no worries. Look on the bright side, no one, uh, you haven't had your podiatry problems exposed for the world to see, so it could be worse. <laughs> That's true. Well, thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, dude. Bye-bye.